Hello and how are you? I hope that you are having a fantastic day. We're going to talk about Bitcoin news today. Now, Grayscale holds 1.7% of Bitcoin supply after a record $500 million quarter. So it's hard to imagine any one entity owning almost 2% of all the Bitcoin out there that's available. But today, Grayscale owns that much Bitcoin. So let's get into the news and find out a little bit more. We're going to talk about four different subjects. We're going to look at Ethereum now matches Bitcoin on one key metric. Then we're going to talk about does pre-having Bitcoin hodling explain exchange withdrawals because right now a lot of Bitcoin is being withdrawn from the exchanges. Bitcoin halving will also be a make or break for the stock to flow model according to plan B. And plan B has historically been extremely accurate on Bitcoin pricing predictions and they've done it by using what's called a stock to flow model. A stock to flow model is similar to how they measure the scarcity of things like gold, silver, and platinum. And uh, Plan B has been applying the stock to flow model to Bitcoin and the results have been really, really good. But Plan B is saying that this happening and the results of the happening are going to either make or break their current Bitcoin predictions. And then finally, we're going to talk about how Grayscale now holds 1.7% of Bitcoin supply after a record $500 million quarter. So should I buy Bitcoin or should I now or should I wait? We're going to give you ideas to help you make profits and avoid losses. Can we get this video to 99 likes? Smash that like button. It really helps us out. I'm not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice. This is my opinion. So let's look at the Bitcoin or Coin360. Right now, today is April 17th, 2020. It's 6.54 a.m. in the morning on Central Standard Time. Bitcoin at this moment is trading for $7,084. And you can see that the entire market is a mix of reds and greens, depending on the cryptocurrency. My opinion of what I'm seeing, I would say there's more reds than greens, but this is a snapshot in time and it will change in the next few minutes. So Ethereum now matches Bitcoin on one key metric. And I thought this was quite interesting. A Wednesday tweet from Ryan Watkins, research analyst at Misari, revealed data showing the total value transferred on the Ethereum network, including Ether and ERC-20 stablecoins, now matches that of the Bitcoin network. The numbers show Ethereum is becoming the dominant value transfer layer in cryptocurrency, he said. Now, this chart goes all the way back to April 2019th and all the way up to today. And the black line here is the amount of of value transferred using Ether and stablecoins. And then this orange line is the amount of value transferred using Bitcoin and a couple of other metrics added to Bitcoin. And so I thought it was interesting that the two of them have, have kind of merged together right here around uh, April 20th, just before the Bitcoin halving. So I don't know if the halving has anything to do with these two merging, um, but I thought it was very interesting that it's happening right now at this particular time. I don't know if there's any significance to that, but let's look at this further. Value transfer refers to the US dollar value of the total units on a blockchain that are transferred on a given day. With Bitcoin, the metric refers to the U.S. dollar value of all Bitcoin sent on a given day. Value transfer on Ethereum differs slightly, as well as its own Ether cryptocurrency. Ethereum supports assets from third parties that can be sent and received over its network. For the above chart, value transfer on Ethereum refers to the USD value of both Ethereum and Ethereum-based stablecoins that are transferred on a given day. And so I thought it was interesting that that they are converging right now. 
Um, and if you have any ideas on what that might mean as to why it is and if there's any significance to that, I'd sure love to hear from you. I think there might be, but I, it doesn't occur to me. It's just one of those hunches you get. And so this chart is the Ethereum and ERC-20 stablecoins trailing 12 months adjusted transfer value. In other words, the bigger the section, the more money was transferred by that particular token. And it looks at the Ethereum, Tether, USDC, PAX, DAI, TUSD, and GUSD. And so you can see here that the bulk of it was USDT or um, Tether. So USDT on Omni's bigger than all the non-USDT Ethereum-based stablecoins. If you include USDC and the smaller ones, you should also include Omni USDT, Weathermer said. But Watkins was quick to answer, arguing the conclusion remained the same. USDT transfer over Omni's was, has dropped substantially as USDT has migrated over to Ethereum, Watkins said. So I know that was kind of, this This two paragraphs was kind of a little bit confusing. Um, so let me step back and kind of explain it. Basically, there's two different guys that are reporting on this. One guy reported this on Twitter, and this other guy came back and said, well, that's not quite right. And so basically, they're saying that Omni is part of uh, Bitcoin's network and USDT on Ethereum is part of Ethereum's network and he was saying well you didn't include Omni in your data and he's saying well even if I did it wouldn't change the data much. Furthermore the amount of value transferred on Ethereum is slightly underestimated because it only includes the top stable coins that coin metrics provide data for and not all Ethereum based tokens he said. So if you added all Ethereum based tokens these figures on this chart should be quite a bit more for this dark line. And so, um, anyway, it's a new record. The stable coins have grown so great in amount that they are now being widely used as money on the Ethereum blockchain. Instead of sending and receiving value in Ethereum, which is volatile, users can send value in stable coins, which are price stable with the US dollar, the researcher said. And so you can see here how much some of these stable coins have grown over the last few months since about July of 2019 until uh, January of 2020. And this may have grown significantly even more given that we're now April 2020 and they're not showing that information on this chart. So let's move on. Does pre-having Bitcoin hodling explain exchange withdrawals? So a lot of people are withdrawing money from the exchanges. Bitcoin is being withdrawn from exchanges at a rapid pace. Bitcoin balances on exchanges are falling. Bitcoin users' behaviors could indicate bullish expectations prior to the next month's happening event. I tend to agree with this. Now, this is my opinion. This is not financial advice. Um, but when you find statistics that are showing that people are moving cryptocurrency, Bitcoin in particular, off of the exchanges into either software wallets or hardware wallets, that indicates that they plan on just holding on to that. And nobody holds on to an asset unless they have big expectations for it in the near future. Well, I should say people aren't going to hold on to Bitcoin um, because... Uh, Bitcoin is so volatile that the only reason to hold on to it is because you think it's going to go up in the near future. Otherwise, you'd leave it on an exchange and have, on some exchanges, you could short Bitcoin. And so that would be another reason to leave it on an exchange is if you were trying to bet against Bitcoin going up because you can't do that by hodling Bitcoin. According to analysis from Glassnode, Bitcoin balances on exchanges have been falling precipitously over the last three months. And so in this chart, you have the balances on exchanges in Bitcoin and you have the price of Bitcoin. Now, it lags by a few weeks because this is um, the data from March 16th. And so we don't see data all the way up to today. But you can see by this great big drop, there was a little bit of a spike as, um, as the price of Bitcoin dropped. There was a spike of people increasing the amount of Bitcoin they held on exchanges. 
But then immediately after that, they started withdrawing it from the exchanges. And so all that we see here is that as Bitcoin took that great big drop in the early part of March, the people started buying more and more of it, and then they withdrew it off of the exchanges. So investors are withdrawing Bitcoin from exchange exchanges, potentially indicating a shift to longer term holding strategies. BTC balances have fallen nearly 10% from the highs seen in January. So quite interesting. I think that's actually a really good sign if people are pulling money off of the exchanges and putting it into either software or hardware wallets. Hopefully they're putting them into hardware wallets because a hardware wallet is always a lot more secure than any software wallet you got out there. Um, I, I personally hold all of my cryptocurrency in a hardware wallet, and I always recommend that people do the same. Get your money out of the exchanges. It's risky to have it out there unless you're comfortable with that risk, comfortable with the potential of loss or fraud or you know all the different things that can happen when your money, your cryptocurrency is out there on an exchange. So... Bitcoin halvening will be a make or break deal for the stock to flow model according to plan B. The creator of the stock to flow model, BTC price model, says that the upcoming block reward will decide if it lives or dies. In a series of tweets on April 16th, plan B said that he was sticking by the Bitcoin price increasing by an order of magnitude in the two years after the May halvening. In my opinion, Bitcoin 2020 halvening will be like the 2012 and the 2016 halvenings. As per the stock to flow model, I expect a 10x price order of magnitude, not precise, and that it would take one to two years after the halvening, he wrote. Having, having will make or break the stock to flow model. I hope this halvening will teach us more about underlying fundamentals and network effects. So the underlying fundamentals is <coughs> the things that make the Bitcoin network function and the network effects has to do with the amount of people utilizing the network. So in other words, the more people that have or own Bitcoin, the greater the network effects. And the fewer people that have or own Bitcoin, the lower the network effects. And network effects can be a very significant factor in trying to measure something like this stock-to-flow model. Because as Bitcoin grows as a network, it gains more value, and then the value ends up getting reflected in the price. Um, so said in another way, as you, know, you think about smartphones, it wasn't that long ago, uh, in the early 2000s, mid-2000s, nobody had a smartphone. Smartphones were just getting introduced to the market. And today, out of 7.5 billion people alive on the planet, 5.2, 5.3 billion people have smartphones. And so um, we've gone from nobody having a smartphone to almost everybody having a smartphone in a very short period of time. And that makes the smartphone companies worth a lot of value. And that's what they mean by network effects. It's the effect of <coughs> a network growing and gaining momentum and going into mass adoption. And so that's what we're seeing with Bitcoin as it grows and gains momentum. And so a lot of what the plan B stock to flow model, which you see in this graphic down here, is relying on is the growth of people of more and more people using Bitcoin. Otherwise, the stock to flow model will actually fall apart. The other aspect of it is the amount of Bitcoin that's created every year. So the stock to flow model is based off of science that's used to measure the scarcity of gold or silver or platinum or any other precious metal, and they use the scarcity to try and predict what the future price of those precious metals will be. It's been very, very accurate in terms of price predictions on precious metals when they started applying it to Bitcoin because Bitcoin has a finite supply and there's only so much new Bitcoin that's created every year. They can actually measure how much new Bitcoin is getting mined 
and look at and evaluate that in the same way that they have used the stock to flow models on precious metals. And as you can see by this chart, it's been extremely accurate. This blue line here that tends to jump up and then go straight is the stock to flow model based off of those metrics, based off of measuring the preciousness or the scarcity of Bitcoin. And you can see as it goes all the way back to 2010, how that stock to flow model is very close to mimicking the price of Bitcoin all the way along. And so according to the model's latest incarnation, Bitcoin USD should hit $30,000 by the end of 2020. Now this is not financial advice. This is the opinion of Plan B and the results of the information they learned by applying their mathematic model called stock to flow model to Bitcoin. During crisis events, everything is correlated. So here he starts talking about Bitcoin macro and how Bitcoin dumped when the stock market dumped. And he said, during crisis, everything is correlated. What's next is what's interesting they will not be correlated for forever, in my opinion, according to Plan B. And I, I, in my opinion, I agree with them that Bitcoin tanked only because everything tanked. You know, some people said, oh, well, Bitcoin doesn't have a store of value because it tanked along with the stock market. But you don't say that about gold, even though gold tanked along with the stock market. You don't stop going, oh, well, gold doesn't have a store of value because the price of it dropped along with the stock market. So it's silly to apply that same logic to Bitcoin when you don't apply it to any other asset. Recently, some well-known cryptocurrency figures have criticized the concept, arguing it is simply too optimistic and has created a cult with reference reinforces its prognosis. So this is a contrary opinion to the Plan B's stock-to-flow model. So we'll see. Time will tell whether or not it actually is accurate. To be clear, the guy who made the Bitcoin or Plan B confirmed, I expect the stock-to-flow model relationship to hold. But that's Plan B's opinion. And, you know, to be honest with you, in my opinion, I kind of think that the stock-to-flow model is going to hold out and is going to continue its relationship with Bitcoin. In fact, as Bitcoin gains momentum in the area of mass adoption, depending on how quickly that momentum occurs, depending on how quickly people, I mean, with things like India going out there and changing the Supreme Court, changing the laws um, and, and the regulations saying that India cannot trade in Bitcoin and now they can trade in, in, in Bitcoin, because of the ruling in the Supreme Court in India and all of the other things. I mean, if you look at the videos I have out there, we're approaching 200 different videos. There's a wealth of evidence as to why uh, Bitcoin has a bright future. And because of all of that, I'm wondering if we're going to see such a massive increase in things like the, the uh, adoption rate of Bitcoin that it actually increases its volume. So the final article we want to look at is Grayscale now holds 1.7% of Bitcoin supply after a record $500 million quarter. Almost 2% of the world's Bitcoin supply is now under the control of a single company, Grayscale and its Bitcoin trust, GBTC. GBTC is a stock that you can purchase on the uh, uh, stock market. So if you have an account with, say, TradeStation, TD Ameritrade, E-Trade, um, Robinhood, etc., if you have a, a, a account set up on one of the different exchanges where you can buy stocks, you can also buy the GBTC ticker, which is the Grayscale uh, Bitcoin Trust. In its latest quarterly report on April 16, Grayscale referred revealed that the GBTC now contains 1.7% of the circulating supply of Bitcoin. In terms of assets under management as a proportion of the total cryptocurrency market, Grayscale controls 1.2% of the world's cryptocurrencies. Overall, Grayscale's 10 crypto funds attracted over $500 million in investment, making it its, it's the best record best quarter on record. Qu 
quarter over quarter inflows more than doubled to 503 million, demonstrating demand is reaching new peak levels even at the risk off environment, the report summarizes. And so to kind of break this down a little bit, uh, Grayscale has been growing at a rapid race and uh, at a rapid pace, and many times the new quarter compared to the previous quarter has shown tremendous growth. But over the last three to six, three, four, five, six quarters, Grayscale has almost been doubling uh, on a on a consistent basis, and so they've just been increasing momentum in terms of the number of people who are actually going out to the stock market and purchasing the GBTC token or investing in the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. And so that's forcing Grayscale's investments to increase. And you can see this is a chart of, of Grayscale. The gray line is the percentage of circulating Bitcoin supply. And then the darker blue line, almost black area, is the percent of total market cap of cryptocurrency, of all cryptocurrencies, that Grayscale owns. And so you can see both of them have been dramatically increasing over time. As Cointelegraph reported, institutional investors have appeared to weather the coronavirus storm with particular resistance. Activity across Bitcoin futures, for example, bounced back from March lows within weeks. And so this is talking about um, you know, the, the institutional uh, investors, but their uh, purchases and investments into futures markets. Well, one of the things that you do want to know about Grayscale is Grayscale Trust is a good indicator of what institutions are doing because approximately 80 to 85 percent of the money, it varies by quarter, <clears throat> most of the money that's getting invested into the GBTC Trust is from institutions. Um, and most of it meaning 85, uh, between 80 and 85 percent. Again, it depends on which quarter you're looking at, but each quarter, the vast majority of people who are purchasing the GBTC Trust are institutions, not just retail investors. And so that's the news for today. How can I be of service to you? Please leave comments down below in the YouTube channel. I'd love to hear from you. In the meantime, I hope that you'll like, subscribe, and hodl. And do me a favor, have a fantastic day.